Yeah, so good to see what God is doing in and through City Line Church. And I want to again just take an opportunity to welcome you. Uh, I'm just so glad to see all of you. Uh, I, I know what you're thinking. If you've been with us for the last few weeks, you were totally coming today expecting uh, an elephant, right? <laughs> Instead, you got a lion. And you're kind of like, you're so confused <laughs> with what's going on at City Line Church. Here's the reality. Last week, we finished up our series that we called uh, Elephant in the Room. And uh, we finished that up just talking through and tracking through, engaging the discussion about mental health. And so uh, I just want to encourage you, if you didn't get a chance to be with us, and, uh, and I, I really think that you should just take some time out to uh, go to CityLine online or to follow up on the podcast uh, and, and just really track through that series. We talked about a lot of, uh, of key things that are, are burning in your heart that, are, that you have questions about. It's the elephant in your room. And so we wanted to address those and we wanted to take a biblical approach to those. So I wanna invite you to do that. And then also I wanna encourage you already, next week is gonna be a great time because we're getting into a new series that talks about the Bible. It talks about the scriptures and how we engage scripture. My thought is, is that there's a lot of us in the room and they probably have a few key verses that we kind of pull from, that we, we hold on to. They're kind of a, our favorite verses. And there's a few of us in the room that, that maybe uh, understand some biblical stories, but, but few of us understand the story of the Bible and, and how that works and God's overarching story and, and what that means for, for our life. And, and some still ask the question, is the Bible still relevant in my day? Is the, is the Bible, is this supposed to be something that's applied in my life? And so we wanna talk about that and we wanna process through it and give you tools and resources to help better understand that. But today will be a little bit different. If you're new, it's probably a different message. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about, about us as City Line Church, but I'm also going to talk about the, the church, the big C church, the, the overarching church and the significance of that, because I think it's important that every so often that we spend time as a church being reminded who we are and what we do and why that's important, that we keep understanding the understanding in front of us of what God has called us to and what God has called us to be as a, a community of faith, as the, the body of Christ, both collectively, but also individually. And it's important to create that alignment and that clarity and, and that focus. I'll be honest with you. I don't know if you realize this or not, but congratulations. You are now six months into 2019. Yeah, yeah, th this weekend, the first weekend of June, nobody wants to clap about that. You know what I'm saying? Because, uh, because you're like, where did the time go? Like, how's that even possible, right? Like, it feels like we were just talking in January about some incredible things that were gonna happen in the life of our church. And now here we are in June and we're like, did those things actually happen? Like, did, did those things actually come to pass? I wanna give you a quick snapshot update before I get into some of the teaching that I wanna to cover today in the last six months because here's the reality about life. Life flies by so fast and if you don't slow down long enough, you will miss it. You will miss out on what's going on. And same as the church. Sometimes you get into the church and depending on how involved you are in the church or, or how often you're able to come to church, you, you can just go into the first six months of the year and not fully realize what you're a part of and what God is doing among you. And so I want to kind of give you some kind of updates on some of those things that we talked about. At the end of last year, we talked about two, uh, bringing on two new people to our, our, our team as far as uh, on the pastor level. Today, you got to meet one of them. He was hosting for his first time today. His name is Caleb Miller. He's our youth pastor. And so we thank God for that, that he's here. He's been with us for the last six months, and uh, he, we keep adding to the list of firsts in his life. He's like, it's the first time I hosted it. I'm like, yeah, don't screw it up, okay? Like, just get up there, like, make it happen, right? Uh, and, then, and then also, we said it was time for us as a church to continue to expand on our team um, by way of an executive pastor. And so God had been working in the heart of one of our elders who was uh, working in corporate America. We went to him and asked him to pray about becoming our executive pastor, and right before the new year, we added on Alan Bob as our executive pastor, leaving corporate America, serving the kingdom of God now. And so we're, we're thrilled for that. And those guys are doing a great job in those environments. And then as we continue to grow, we told you about a, a little initiative that we had that we wanted to make room that as the church continues to grow and develop and God entrusts more people to our care, we said, you know, we're, we're running out of space. We, we need to make more room. And so we had this crazy idea to, to create a fourth service time, that we wanted to create a fourth service time for people to come to know Jesus, people who maybe had, had to stop coming to church because work schedules changed, people who weren't coming to church because, they, I don't know, just Sunday mornings are hard for them. 
And so we said, well, what if we created a new service time? So we launched in January the 6 p.m. service time with the thought of, okay, God, we're going to trust you with this. We don't know who's going to show up, but I'm thankful to report to you that in the last six months, the average attendance, and we're not about numbers at this church, but I think it's significant for you to know that as a church, we've seen an average of 70 people on Sunday nights at 6 p.m., right? Which means, yeah, that, that's, that's a huge something to be thankful for because that means that those are people who weren't initially coming to church or people who were displaced from church or are people who, who we say, you know, we're going to cast those nets out far and wide again and we're going to give them another option to be a part of church. And so if they were out of town or if they were working overnight and they needed to get some sleep because how many of you know sleep is good? Amen, somebody. You know, like, then the reality is, is you can still come to church at night and celebrate with your church family and still grow in your understanding of God. And we've also met people who are coming to church for the first time just because 6 p.m. made perfect sense for them in their daily life. And I'm so thankful that you chose to be bold as a church. Many of you said, I'm gonna give up my seat. Some of you helped us launch that service. Some of you are still helping us by serving at that service. And I just want to say thank you for being the kind of church that is willing to attend one and, and serve one. Uh, also excited to report that the way that we see like that people are taking next steps in their faith is, is that by their spiritual growth, about, about the, the ways that they are, are getting plugged in, they're getting connected, and they're getting involved. And, and so we, in our first quarter, we try to do this quarterly, we, unless you just want to be baptized any given time, because we'll baptize on any given Sunday, I'm just saying. Um, but, but we decided to hold baptisms uh, in, in April, right before Easter came. And I'm so thrilled that 17 people stepped up and said yes to Jesus Christ through water baptism. That's proclaiming Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's just in the first six months, and we're not even done yet. We got three more quarters, right? You got another baptism coming up in June, and I'm just excited about what God has in store and what God is going to do. And then because we're a church that says, hey, as God is leading us, we want to be the kind of church that actually, that actually is helping people grow in their leadership that we wanna to learn to love well and to lead well as a church. So we had this crazy idea that we worked on for about a year to come up with the City Line Leadership College. And we rolled it out to you guys. And again, it was one of those steps of faith. How do you track people through a six month program, helping them become better leaders, both in industry, but also in the kingdom and also you know, serving God and you know, whatever they're pursuing. And so we said, we're gonna do this. And here's the reality. So many people showed up to be a part of the City Line Leadership College that we ran out of space in the room. Like on the preview night, like I felt really bad that there were people sitting on the floor. We were bringing in extra chairs because so many people were excited. And when it came time for enrollment, we had over 30 people sign up to be a part of the City Line Leadership College, right? Growing and developing in their understanding of how God has created them to lead. And it's been so fun. We're four months into that program. We got about two months left. And you know, just like any college, sometimes you got some people that got to drop. You know what I'm saying? Like sometimes you got people that are like, hey, life has changed and I, you know, I got, I got to revisit this another time in my life and that's okay. But out of those 30, 33 that signed up, we still have 22 that are faithful in this program that are going to see it through all the way to the end. And so I think that's something that's exciting. Why am I talking about all this stuff? Because I think you need to be aware of your church, what God is doing in your church, just in the, the first six months of 2019, let alone the three years that we've been known as City Line Church right? Because if we don't slow down long enough to take it in, then we miss it. And we also begin to miss that, you know what, this church, it's way bigger than us. That everything that happens here, it's way bigger than us. In fact, over 2,000 years ago, there, there was a, a group of people that gathered together in a Middle Eastern city that began a movement that would circle the globe, that would forever impact the world and individuals and cultures forever and all time. That movement was known as the church. And the church is actually the only institution that can actually stand the test of time because the church has been and always will be to the best of our ability to be a living, breathing, moving organism not a cold and lifeless organization. We're a living, breathing organization that we, 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 we keep, we're an organism that, that moves forward, we're, we're or, that we have life given to us by the creator of life, that he's empowered us to be a movement. And the reality is, is there's nothing greater than that. The, the way you can say it is that the church is the only endeavor that will last forever. Think about this for a second. It's the only endeavor that will last forever because let's just be honest. I mean, how many of you remember growing up shopping at Mervyn's, yes. right? Nobody go to Mervyn's no more. Mervyn's don't even exist, right? Like how many of you got fired up that first time you bought your electronics from, from uh, Circuit City? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> What about that time that Circuit, Circuit City felt all shamed out because, you know, like Incredible Universe opened, 
right? And you guys went to Incredible Universe. Some of you don't know about Incredible Universe. I see the look on your face like, did I miss out on something? It's already gone. Sorry, you can't, you can't go back. All right, so, so you remember when you used to be able to come home after a long day's work and pick up something real quick at Fresh and Easy? Yeah, oh, 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 you don't want to talk about it now, right? And then some of us are still shedding a tear about, you know, Toys R Us and, uh, and KB Toys and... Uh, and all these things that at, from a kid, when we grew up, we thought, oh, they're just going to be around forever. They, they, they're so big. They're so larger than life. Every mall that you go to has the Mervins. Everywhere you look, there's a Toys R Us. There's all these things that are, and it just looks huge, but yet they can't even st stand the test of time. But you know what has? The church. God, his church is the only endeavor that will actually last forever. Why? Because there's something special about the church. Times change around us. Times change over and over again, but the mission of Jesus is constant. The, the, the movement of Jesus is consistently moving forward. And you and I, here's the good news. We've been invited to be a part of it. We've been invited to be a part of God's mission in the earth around us. But what, what is the church? How did the church get this message? And, and where did this come from? If you're following along in your notes, I hope you'll join us and, and just kind of track through this for a moment. Matthew, uh, chapter 16, Matthew was a follower of Jesus. And as he began to document the life of Jesus, he documents a conversation that Jesus has with the, kind of the, his closest 12 disciples. And he asks them a foundational question. He says, hey, who do people say that I am? You know, I just want to know, what's the word on the street? What are people saying about me? To which they all say, well, there's a lot of things that people are saying about you. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that people are saying about you. And some say you're kind of, you know, you're John the Baptist. Other, others of you are like, you're like, uh, I don't know, like Elijah, like 2.0. You know what I mean? Like, you're, like they're, 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 we're trying to figure it out. Like, everybody's so amazed and kind of just dumbfounded by you, Jesus. To which Peter, Peter, our guy, one of, one of my favorite disciples, because Peter's so rash and he's so out there, he just kind of blurts out like, ooh, Jesus, I have the answer. I have the answer to that question. Jesus, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. In other words, Peter stops and he says, you are the one that we've been waiting for. You are the one that we've hoped for. You are the one that we've always heard about. You are the son of the living God. This is God who has come to be with us, Emmanuel. You are our Messiah, to which Jesus responds to Peter. Peter, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. It's almost like, hey, don't trip, Peter. Like, you ain't that smart. You know what I'm saying? Like, like don't, don't, like, like just really realize this is something that God has revealed to you. Why is that important? Because when God, when we begin to, to grow closer to God, when you begin to spend time with Jesus, you begin to know Jesus more. And when you know Jesus more, you have revelation about what God is doing. You, 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 you begin, God begins to reveal his plan and his purpose for your life. He says, blessed are you because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you, as Jesus responds with this big old statement, he says, now I say to you, Peter, which means rock, upon this rock, I will build my, what's the word? Church. I will build my church. And, and I love that because Jesus says, hey, I know you don't quite understand this. This is going to sound funny and weird to you, but here's what I need you to know. Peter, based on that foundation that you just said, based on the proclamation that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God, Jesus says, based on that statement, I'm going to build this church. I'm going to build my church, not just a church, but my church. And then Jesus follows it up with a promise that I love. And all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Amen. I'm just saying, some of you got to be careful because you're going to make me preach today. And, and, and you might as well call for, have Uber Eats stop by and drop off lunch now. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm just, I'm just saying. He says, I'm going to build my church and all the powers of hell will, will not conquer it. I love that. that. That means that no matter what may happen, no matter what may come, no matter the struggle, no matter the trouble, no, no matter the issue, no matter who comes and who goes, that nothing ever would ever be able to affect the church bad enough that the church would cease to exist. I don't know about you, but I love, I love the church. The, like the big C church, not just City Line Church, but like the church overall. I get it. It's ugly sometimes, and I get it. It's messy sometimes, and I get it that the church has made mistakes sometimes, but I love the promise that Jesus has made to the church that not even the gates of hell will conquer his church. The chances are, though, when you and I think about church, we think of something radically different, though, than what Jesus is talking about. 
That if I was to ask you your definition of church, many of you would, would arrive at your definition of church based off some past experience, some, something that you went through at church or, or something that you maybe have grown up knowing about church or some of you, you're, you're new in your faith, you're coming to know Jesus for the first time and, and this is the only snapshot that you ha have of church and so you're trying to formulate your definition. The good news is that no matter what we define as church, it's probably radically different than anything that Jesus ever intended the church to be. That's actually a good thing because Jesus always calls us to something greater, right? Something greater than we can imagine, greater that we understand. Jesus always has more in store. So our job today is to begin to rethink church a little bit, to begin to rethink what we know of church and, and how the church exists and what the church actually does. My hope is that we'd be able to walk through this today and understand what Jesus meant for his church, his goals for his church. Most scholars would agree that Jesus, when he, when he spoke, his language was, was in Aramaic. However, when the New Testament was translated, it's translated into Greek. And when Matthew sat down to write of the words and sayings of Jesus, he began to document this phrase that I will build my church. And the word that Matthew used, this Greek word that he used for church is fascinating. He used this word ekklesia, ekklesia. If you've been around City Line for any period of time, you probably have heard that word. You probably know about, my hope is that you know about this word because it's foundational to who we are as a church. Ecclesia simply means gathering, assembly, or congregation. It's a gathering of people. It's an assembling of people. You look around in this room, you see an assembly of people, multi-ethnic, multi-generational, from all different backgrounds, centering in on one thing that is the main thing, that is Jesus Christ. Right? We're one family. We're all together in this with one heavenly father. You, you see this gathering of people, this assembly, this, this congregation uh, that, that is coming together to proclaim the name of Jesus. And Jesus declared that I, I'm going to build this gathering, that I'm going to create this movement, and this movement will have a mission. However, over time, there was a, a tragedy in translation. That as these scriptures began to be uh, uh, translated over time in different languages, for whatever reason, the, the, the translations that, that came to be left out the word ecclesia. And instead of being ecclesia, it was superimposed another word over there from a German derivative of the word where we get church, which was known as kirch. Sounds weird, right? Sounds almost like church, Right? But, but it became to be known, this German word fit in here instead of ecclesia, and the German word translated is house of the Lord. House of the Lord. You see the difference? A gathering and congregation of people versus the house of the Lord. This German understanding of the word church was actually a callback to an Old Testament understanding that in the Old Testament there was a temple. That you would go to the temple if you wanted to be in God's presence. The understanding was that God's presence dwelled in the temple. And so that you would make your pilgrimage, you would make your way to the temple. And when you got to the temple, you couldn't have direct access to God. That there was a priest there that would, that would go to God on your behalf. That he was allowed to enter into the holy of holies. That, that he would go to God for you while you waited. But you knew for sure that to go to church, you would go to the temple because that's where God dwelt. In the New Testament, Jesus begins to describe something radically different. And the problem with this understanding of this being the, the house of the Lord for that time and that age, understanding this idea of a place instead of a gathering, was the simple fact that, that when the church became a building, it, all these problems began to arise with it. Because the ones who actually controlled the building were the ones who ultimately controlled the church. And the one who controlled the building and controlled the church ultimately controlled Scripture. And those who controlled the building and who controlled church and who controlled, uh, controlled scripture ultimately controlled people. That's a lot of times saying controlled. Just saying. Get a little tongue-tied there, right? You get where I'm going with it, right? You understand. This is how it, it was set up, that the church became a, mun a manipulative place of being. That there was this uh, control that was exhibited there. But unfortunately, in this tragedy of translation, instead of being this gathering or this assembly that had a mission and it actually was a movement, that the reality was it just became known as a building, that church became this place that you go. 
The problem with that, though, is understanding that Jesus never predicted a building of a place, but he predicted the building of a people, that he wanted to do something in the lives of people, that people were going to make the difference, that people were his plan to actually change the world around us, that you and I, invited into his mission, empowered by his spirit, would do something so radical, so life-changing, that the world would be forever affected by it. It's something that started before us. It's something that we're invited to. It is something that will exist long after us. Right? It's God. It's, 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 his, it's his church. Right? It's, it's who we are. He's raising up a, a people, a living, breathing movement, not a, a sterile institution. This gathering of people, though, that this movement. How many of you know that the movement always needs power? <laughs> anytime that you, you're going to have a movement, anytime you're going to get your car to go from point A to point B, you got to gas it up. Right? Like, like you need any, any re- uh, revolution is going to require some sort of stimulus to help it be empowered to move forward. Acts chapter 1, Jesus dies. He's, he's raised to new life, and he shows up. He begins showing himself to people to, as if to say, see, I told you so. I did exactly what I said I would do. I, I, I told you that I would be crucified on a cross. I'd be buried in the grave, but on the third day, I'd be raised to new life. People hung out with him. They talked with him. They experienced Jesus. And Jesus began to teach this gathering of people. He began to teach this, this movement, and the movement got started. He says this in Acts chapter 1. He says, but you will receive power. How will it happen? When the Holy Spirit... When the Holy Spirit comes on you, and here's what will happen when you receive power as this gathering, as this movement of of like-minded people. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my my witnesses. You're my witnesses, which is is interesting. It's kind of like a a court phrase, right? Most of us know about being a witness because of a court of law, or, or you're being on a jury, or you've heard those things. Jesus is telling his church that you are going to be witnesses of the good news of Jesus Christ. You're going to be witnesses of the power of Christ. And how will that look like? You will experience it in your life as God does a transformational, restorative work in your life, as he takes your old self and your old old things and your old decisions and he makes you new and now you're able to talk about it and share about it and point people to others saying that I am not good enough and I know that I didn't deserve it but Jesus Christ gave his life for me and he changed everything knowing that Jesus is the only thing that can actually change everything he says you're going to be my witnesses and here's what I love about this idea of witness you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria even to the ends of the earth now think about this for a second that sounds like a big task doesn't it if we're honest like that's big that's like that's that's not like saying oh you're going to be my witnesses in Lakewood Bellflower Artesia Cerritos you know what I mean like that that, those are just those that that, you're still in Jerusalem (laughs) you know what I'm saying like he's talking about like to the ends of the earth. Like he's talking about like this, this message, like the, the, this, the, the momentum of this movement is actually going to spread out and it's going to exist far beyond even your capacity to which if I'm standing there and I'm listening to Jesus' speech and I'm with a hundred or so other people, I'm kind of like, how's that going to work? <laughs> like how, how's that supposed to happen? Like how, how, how is that supposed to work? You know what I love about the early church? The church wasn't caught up in asking the question of, how's that going to work? And how's that going to turn out? And how's that going to happen? You know what the church was about? The church was about obedience to Jesus Christ. He said that you are going to be my witnesses. So start in Jerusalem. Don't worry about how you're going to get to Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Just start right there in Jerusalem. And as God begins to open up the door for your Judea and for your Samaria and for your ends of the earth, just be faithful to follow. Just continue to be obedient. Continue to walk through the doors that he's opening up for you. See, it was, it was an, a focus on obedience, not having all of our questions answered, not having all of our T's crossed and our I's dotted. It was just a matter of, I, I know in, who I believe in, and I'm persuaded that he is able. Even if I don't know how it's going to work out, I, I, know, I know that he, he can. He said, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You're going to be my witnesses in all Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, even into the ends of the earth. And what I love about that is here you and I are today. These followers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all seizing their opportunity to be a part of the movement known as the church. Paul, Peter, 
Timothy, all seizing their opportunity to be a part of the church, to make an impact in their generation, to make an impact in the people around them, to make an impact in their Jerusalem and their Judea and their Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. And yet that message can stay consistent. It came before them, it happened through them, and it was beyond them to where you and I now know and we sit here today in this very room. Part of the promise that Jesus gave that nothing, nothing would come between him and his church, that, that nothing would be able to stop this good news from moving forward. The, the book of Acts is actually a snapshot of this, this first church's experience. And I'll be honest with you, if you read the book of Acts, it's so incredibly exciting to read about all that God did in and through that church. But you know what I know about that, that book of Acts? It's incredibly challenging as well. You know why it's challenging? Because I have to sit back and I have to think about all the obstacles and, 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 and detours that the early church had that you and I will never have to experience. You and I are not in fear of being persecuted for our faith, being jailed for our faith, being beaten for our faith. You and I aren't worried about, about like, how are we going to get this word out? Because many of us would be like, well, I'll just tweet about it. Right? Like, I'm just, I'm just going to pay for an ad on Instagram. You know, actually, I'll just pay for more followers on Instagram. Right? They didn't have Instagram, they didn't have Twitter, they didn't have Facebook, you couldn't tag all your friends, right? Like you had to walk, right? You had to get out in your sandals. You had to take the message next door. You had to go down the street. You had to spend some time and effort and energy in being a witness of Jesus Christ and his good news. But us, we, we sit back with all the comforts and, and everything that we have. And, and sometimes if we're not careful, let's just be honest with ourselves. We can easily miss an opportunity to be a part of the mission, to be a part of what God is calling us to. The church was God's idea, and we've been invited to be a part of it for our generation. What does that look like? What, what would it look like for City Line to continue the movement? What would it look like for us to not just come to church on the weekend, but actually to be about the movement all throughout the week? In fact, here's something I want to say to you as your pastor. I want to give you permission to stop coming to church. To which some of you are like, that's crazy talk. And I actually kind of like this church. And I kind of like coming here on the weekend. I love it that you love coming here on the weekend. And you're like, well, that's crazy because most pastors are like, hey, please come to church. You know, no, I I'm not saying stop gathering. I'm not saying stop getting together. I'm not saying stop coming together, praying with one another, singing together, celebrating Jesus Christ. But I'm saying stop coming to church just to check something off your weekly list. Stop coming to church just to show up to appease God and actually start being the church. Start living out the church. Start being a part of the movement and the mission of God in the earth around you, on your job, in your family, in your neighborhood, at your kid's school. Wherever you go, you are a follower of Jesus Christ. The mission still stands. It doesn't shut off after Sunday. So what would it look like for City Line to continue to be a part of this movement? Because let's be honest with ourselves. I go to church is a lot different than saying I am the church. Amen. I go to church is a lot different than saying I am the church. And you and I, we come to a reality that we serve a purpose that is bigger than ourselves. And we know that as City Line Church, we talk about this a lot, that the reality is to reach people that nobody else is reaching, we have to be willing to do things that nobody else is doing. That's why we get CT, the city lion up here, dancing for you. Because if CT is going to lead families and kids to Jesus, then we'll do whatever we got to do to get CT out on the streets, getting kids to know a little bit more about Jesus. In other words, we'll stop nothing short of sin to help people come to know Jesus. Right? We do have a boundary. We, we won't go over it. We're not going to sin, but, but, but you know, we're going to do anything possible by all means necessary to help people come to know Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus matters. Jesus makes all the difference. Jesus, he can change our life, and we need people to understand and know that, which is why I'm so excited about a little over five years ago when the planning began for City Line Church, when the, the launch team began to get together and dream about what City Line would be. City Line did not begin with this idea of just being another great church in this area because we understood that there were plenty of great churches in this area. There still are plenty of great churches in this area, and we love them all because there is no competition. We're a part of the kingdom of God. But the reality behind City Line Church is what I love about City Line is City Line began with the heart of being a different kind of church. It began with the heart of, of setting out with a vision that thinks that church can and should be different. It, it's a church where everyone is welcome, where no one is an outsider. It's a church that is perfectly comfortable with understanding that this is the perfect place for imperfect people. 
It's the perfect place for imperfect people that we want to invite people to come and be authentic and to be transparent and to work through their stuff because Jesus loves you just as you are, but he refuses to allow you to stay that way. He has something greater for your life. We're, we're our place. We are a church where we actively remove the walls and barriers that tend to keep people from knowing Jesus. We're the kind of church that is a multi-ethnic, multi-generational church. And let's be real, we fight hard for that. That doesn't just come natural. It doesn't just come automatically. No, you have to fight to see the person across from you that don't look like you and don't think like you and don't act like you, to see them as your brother and your sister in Christ Jesus, to see them as the family of God, to come against all this stuff and all this viral stuff that our culture says should divide us and keep us disconnected from one another. We say, no, 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 Jesus is bigger than all that. He is our heavenly father. We are united in his name. So all the difference of race and class and ethnicities and all of a sudden, you know, we'll just celebrate it then. We'll celebrate who you are, but we're going to celebrate that we're family. I got brothers and sisters that don't look like me, don't act like me, don't think like me, and it's a beautiful thing. It's messy. (laughs) It's messy. You know it. It's messy, but it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Why? Because it's a picture of a redeemed community. It's a picture of what happens in in people's lives when Jesus takes first place, when Jesus becomes the center of it all, that we can get together and we can love one another and we can grow together. We can do life with each other. It's a beautiful thing. And it's the body of Christ that we understand as City Line Church, we're not created to be spectators, but to be active participators in the kingdom of God. We're active participators in the kingdom of God. So what does being the church actually look like? Well, what is being this unstoppable movement, being a part of this unstoppable movement? What, what does that actually mean for our, our lives? See, at City Line, if you've been here for any amount of time, you should know this mission by now. We, we are, are absolutely relentless about helping people discover and follow Jesus. You go to City Line Church and people ask you, tell me a little bit about your church. You know what? We're relentless about helping people discover and follow Jesus. What? Yeah, what does that mean? Well, we're just going to do whatever, we, whatever it takes to help people discover and follow Jesus. We're going to keep talking about Jesus. We're going to keep pointing people to Jesus. We're going to provide environments where people can learn more about Jesus. Why? Because the church is unstoppable. The message of Jesus is unstoppable. It extends beyond all barriers. It goes against all lines. And it's being the church is simply choosing to be unstoppable with your invitation. You and I have a responsibility to be unstoppable with our invitation, to help people passionately pursue Jesus. That's what we do here on the weekend. We don't just sit here. We don't just take up space. You know what? We're passionately pursuing Jesus. We have a party with a purpose in here. That's why we got our hands up. That's why we're dancing. That's why some of you that you know you can't sing and you sing loud anyway right? Because it doesn't matter. You're making a joyful noise unto the Lord, right? Because you know he's worthy and he deserves it and he is great, right? And so we choose to throw a party with a purpose. We get here on the weekend and we're helping people passionately pursue him. And so we invite people to that. Just like any other party, you would invite them, wouldn't you? You want them to be, hey, don't miss out. This is the party of the year. Like, like don't, don't miss out on that. Like, it's the party of the year. In fact, I want to congratulate you. You guys, actually, you know how to invite people. You know that any weekend is a good weekend to invite people, but man, let me tell you, you guys went above and beyond on Easter. Can I, can I be real with you for a second? But, but I also want to back it up with something that I think we also have to hear. You guys, you guys went next level on Easter, and I, and I just want to celebrate the fact, again, we're not numbers driven, but I think this is important for you to know. Over our four Easter services and our two overflow services next door, we had just under 900 people over, over Easter. It's incredible that God entrusted 900 people to our care. But here's what I need you to understand, church. And please hear me in love and in grace. And when I, when I say this, I need you to understand something about City Line Church. Every single weekend at City Line Church is Easter weekend. Because every single weekend, we celebrate the fact that Jesus Christ came, that he died, that he was buried in a grave, but he didn't stay dead, that he was raised to new life. And because he was, we can receive new life. And so we celebrate that every single weekend. We invite every single weekend because every weekend is just another opportunity for people to come to know Jesus, right? Every weekend is Easter weekend. There's no holding back that we should see. If you look around you and if there's seats empty next to you, understand and know that we still have an opportunity in front of us to be unstoppable with our invitation. And I get it. Sometimes they say no. 
Sometimes they say no. I told this in the last service. I, I, got, I got a friend at the barbershop that I go to that I've been inviting him to come and be with us like for like a year now. I'm like, bro, I'll see you this weekend. I was just there on Friday. I was like, he was like, man, he's like, I think I'm gonna come to your church. I'm like, dude, I've been waiting. I've been waiting. I've been asking you like every other week when I come up in here like to come to church with me, like, would you, would you come? He's like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm gonna come hang out. So I was leaving and I said, hey, I'll catch you on Sunday. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, yeah. And so I left. Yeah. We got one more service tonight. I'm still waiting, right? Like, I'm still, like, I get it. Like, it's hard. But that's not going to stop my invitation, right? I'm going to see him again. I'm going to say, hey, bro, missed you. What do you mean, missed you? Yeah, you didn't make it to church. I understand. But guess what? The invite still stands. I'm going to keep pursuing. I'm going to keep asking. I'm going to keep inviting. I can't change a person's life, but I know who can. I know who can. And if I can continue to invite them to that, then things change. I become unstoppable with my, my invitation. Luke 14, 23 says, Then the master told his servant, Go out into the roads, into the country lanes, and compel them to come in. Why? So that my house will be full. I don't know if you know this or not, but God desires his house to be full. God wants to see his house. That's why we talk about being the kind of church that is willing to make room. We're going to make room. Not only did we add a fourth service, but we said, you know what? As God continues to entrust people to our care, as he begins to move in people's lives, then you know what we're going to do? We're blowing out this back wall. We said we're doing this building expansion. When we're pushing out the back wall, we're adding more seats. And some of you, you've heard about that over time. You can see pictures of it in the lobby. And I'm just happy to report that we've done everything on our end. We're just waiting for the city to sign off on a couple of things. We're waiting for a couple of other agencies to sign off on a couple of other things. And the hope is now that everything is engineered and in their hands, that by God's favor, his grace, and his mercy, that if all goes well, we'll be pulling permits in July and getting ready to break some ground so that we can continue to expand the kingdom of God, right? That's the reality of making the invite. It's God's will that his house be full, to which some of you would be like, ah, but I don't know about big churches. Like, big churches, like, just kind of freaks me out a little bit, and I just kind of like it small, you know, like, I like to just kind of, like, know everybody, and I get nervous because I don't want to become disconnected, you know, I was a part of that before, and I said, can I, can I share something with you real quick, Let me, just a little secret between you and I? Uh, we're already big. <laughs> if you're going based on averages, if you're going based on, uh, on the average across the United States, like, you know what, it's not uncommon to recognize City Line Church as something bigger than, than what might be happening in the norm of somewhere else. But that's not to tout us, and that's not to put our name up there. It's to say that Jesus Christ is alive and well, and that he's working in City Line Church, and we will stop at nothing to let other people know. It's all about the one who is not here yet. It's all about those who have yet to walk through our doors. Why? Because I want my house to be full. And the way that you escape from, from, from this fear of, oh, if the church gets too big and I, and I won't know anybody, is it, to be unstoppable with your involvement. Yeah. It's to be unstoppable with your involvement. It's to say, hey, I'm, I'm going to be involved in the life of the church. I'm going to be involved in the things that are going on in church. I'm going to, key word, I'm going to participate in things in the life of the church. We talk about building authentic community all the time. It's not just pursuing Jesus on Sunday. It's building authentic community all throughout the week. What does that look like? Acts chapter 2. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and the breaking of bread and to prayer. Get this. They did what we are doing today. They got together. They hung out. They celebrated. They worshiped together. They, they prayed together. They, they took of the Lord's Supper together. They remembered what Jesus has done for them. They yeah, understand the significance of that. And they devoted to that. And he says, everyone was filled with awe and many signs and wonders were performed by the apostles. God was working and moving in them and through them. And people were amazed by that. And all the believers were together and they had everything in common. And then something crazy happened, right? Because they were involved in the life of the church, because they were involved in just a normal daily living life together, guess what? They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Now you're like, that's kind of crazy and weird. That's just a part about recognizing that as I'm involved, I will see people in my family, see my brothers and sisters, I will see need. And because of what God has given me, I have the responsibility and the capacity now to actually act, to actually come alongside them, to actually help them. And it's not to get something from them. It's not to, well, I'll give this to you as long as you give this back to me. It's like, nope, what's mine is yours. What's yours is mine. We're, we're a family. This is the involvement that they showed in this early church. And guess what happened? Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. And they broke bread together in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. In other words, when the church got involved, 
and doing life together, the world took notice. When we got, when, when the church stopped just going to church, but began to be the church and to serve one another and to come alongside each other, the world took notice. And as the world took notice, people began to say, I want to be a part of that. I want to get involved in that. I want to know what's so different about that that I'm not experiencing out there or somewhere else. Why is my culture and society so different than that? The reality is Jesus changes Everything is Jesus that matters. Be unstoppable with your generosity, at which point everybody pumps the brakes and gets uncomfortable. Be unstoppable with your generosity, and you're like, uh, Jack, you say you don't talk a lot about money here. This is, this is not going to be that one time, is it? <laughs> this is not that moment, right? Like, you know, I'm gonna, I want you to breathe for a second. I'm, I'm not going to so much focus on, on money, but I'm saying being unstoppable with your generosity is everything that you have. It is your time. It is your talent. It is, it, is, it is your skills, your abilities, the things that God has put in your hand. And yes, it is your money. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on money today, but here's what I need you to know about money. God is calling you to trust him. In fact, he is challenging you to trust him. It's the only place in scripture that God asks you to challenge him, and that's with your money. It's with your money. You have to know that. And God, God does not need your money. He's not after your money. God is after your heart. He desires your freedom. He wants to set you free from the control that money has in your life so that you'll begin to breathe again. You'll experience joy again. You'll have peace again. Be unstoppable with your generosity. Be unstoppable with your time. Show up and help Neighborhood VBS. H hug and hold some babies. H help some students. Slap some high fives on the way in and bring some joy to some people's faces because they haven't seen anybody smile at them all week, right? Come and pass out some donuts and serve some coffee, right? Because, you know, coffee's free-flowing around City Line Church, right? And, and everybody loves a little caffeine, right? <laughs> but we can't do it without you. The reality is, is every single thing that this church does, from behind the scenes to front of the scenes to the only thing that may be seen on the weekend, it all matters, Every single part of it matters. And if we're not involved in being generous with our time, our talents, and the gifts that God has given us, then guess what? We become deficient as a church. We, we become lacking as a church. And here's the reality is Proverbs 11, 24 through 25 says, one person gives freely yet gains even more. Isn't that weird? Right? You think, well, if I give it, I'm never going to get it back. If I, if I give it, like, I don't know how this is going to work. No, one person gives freely, meaning like you're willing, you, you live open-handed, and then you gain even more. But another, they withhold unduly, which means you really got no reason why you wouldn't give. You're just scared. You, you just, you just uh, I think I need to control it. Like, I, I, it feels better in my pocket. You know, like, I, I, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can hold it open. It says that, that you withhold unduly, but, it, but you, you end up here. Poverty. He says, but a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. This is what God does when we live open-handed, when we live into being unstoppable with our generosity. The reality is, is that the more that we give, God continues to bless us with more. Why? Because he sees that we're faithful with what's in our hand. And as we're faithful with what's in our hand, he desires to bless us with more. And I don't think it's just so he can show that it's more. He just wants us to understand you will never be able to outgive him. Right? As you give, you will never be able to outgive God. That's why you always end up with more than what you had before when you give. He's a good father. He's a good father that wants, that wants to bless his kids. And lastly, let's be unstoppable with our commitment. Understand that, that we are the salt of the earth. We, we are the salt of the earth. Uh, you know what I love about salt? Salt is committed to being salty. It's committed to being salty. Salt is committed to adding flavor. Salt is committed to being a preserving agent. Jesus says that you and I, as his church, we are the salt of the earth. But he also says if the salt loses its saltiness, then how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. If we, if we draw back our commitment, if we're just halfway committed, then we're not truly being the salt. We're, we're not infecting and impacting the areas that God has entrusted us with, the domains that God has placed us, the doors and opportunities that he's provided for us. But if we choose to be unstoppable with our commitment, leaning into more of God and what he has for our life, then we become the salt of the earth and Jesus follows it up and he says, and you are, you are the light of the world. 
You are the light of your world. What would it look like to committing to let your light shining bright? What would it be like for, for City Line to be that church that we read about in Scripture? This city on a hill that cannot be hidden. That you don't light a fire just to put it under a, a, a bowl. That you actually light the lamp to, to let it burn bright so that others will know about the good news of Jesus Christ. What would it look like to be unstoppable with our commitment to know that we are builders and not consumers? We are givers, not simply containers. We are generous, not collectors, but we are leaders. We are not complainers. <laughs> we are committed to being the light of the world. We are committed to living out in faithful response to what God has done in our life and being the church. The Apostle Paul prayed for the church. He continued to pray for the church, that the church would grab a hold of the significance of being the church. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul says, I pray, and this is my prayer for us as City Line, I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so you can understand the confident hope that he has given to those he has called. His holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. I also pray that you understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Paul says, I pray that you get this. I pray that your heart is flooded with the light of Jesus Christ so that you in turn would be the light to this world. I pray that you would get that God has called you out of the darkness. He has called you out of your mess. He has done a restorative work in your life. He continues to do that and he sends you out on mission, not in your own strength, but by his power and his spirit, which he has given to you. The, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is alive and well in the church. And you and in me as City Line Church. See, the, the church is a movement of people saved by the grace of God who have been sent out into the world by the power of God to fulfill the purpose and the mission of God. You and I, we are the church, and together we are City Line. We get to participate for our generation. We get to respond to the invitation. And my prayer for you and I is that we would take the next step. The church began as a movement and it is still moving. And three years into being City Line, we haven't seen anything yet. But I'm so thankful that you and I, we get to be a part of this incredible journey. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you. I thank you that you see us for who we are, God. And you know us, even all of our in inconsistencies, Lord, and our ups and downs, God. Lord, you still see us as your plan A, Lord God, to impact the world around us. Lord, we are your church. Lord God, a church filled with people, Lord God, who don't always get it right, Lord God. A, a church filled with people, Lord God, who are still filled with lots of fears and insecurities, God. But you're the God that calms those fears. You're a God that reminds us of our identity in you. And you are the God that empowers us by your spirit, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, to be able to live into your greater for our lives. Father, I pray that we as a church, Lord God, we would not forsake that, God. Lord, that we would see the significance of following you, God. Lord, and if we've gotten church wrong, Lord, if we've gotten a, a bad idea or a wrong idea of church, Father, I pray that you would forgive us. God, forgive us, Lord God, and, and Lord, would you renew our minds? Would you help us to think differently about your church? Would you help us to see, Lord, that what we need is you, Jesus? We need more of you. Lord, let there be less of us and more of you, God. Lord, give us the strength, Lord God, to be obedient, Lord, even if all of our questions aren't answered. Lord, do an incredible and radical work in and through our lives and in and through this church, God. Lord, may it impact, Lord, not just the cities, not just the counties, Lord God, not just the states, Lord, but the world around us, Jesus, as we continue to follow you. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, would you stand to your feet and let's worship God together.